This is day four of the February 92 seven day retreat in spring water. Here are some of the questions I wrote down. Regarding what you said yesterday about concentration and a simple open observation, the mind is moving too fast to be clearly observed. What will slow it down so it can be observed intelligently? What do we mean by happiness? We want it, but what is it that we want? Certainly not just an occasional instant of feeling happy, but something more enduring. But then what can be of any kind of endurance in this life of constant change? Rather than seeking for happiness, which always has to do with an idea, with remembrance, can we look into the bottom root of our unhappiness? What is that made up of? To realize that maybe I don't have to try to be happy has brought a certain relief. The relief experienced any time an idea is seen as an idea, and with that, it drops. In doing the cleaning job here, do I do it to be praised, I'm wondering? To be praised by you or somebody else for doing it so well? Or do I do it out of respect and care for this beautiful building? Can looking at all of one's motives become so paralyzing that one doesn't want to do anything anymore for fear of being selfish? Why not bring a fresh breeze into this whole business of effort and concentration? Why not let everyone who wants to make an effort make that effort? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who wants to concentrate, concentrate on mantras, koans, or whatever, do it. And just see for oneself what it does. You seem to have made a distinction between happiness and joy. Can you say some more about that? Today, sitting on the bench near the pond, I felt the cool breeze in my face, and there was a feeling of joy. I hear voices inside me telling me what to do, how I am, what I am, what I should do, and so on. What am I to do? with all this, trusted. A couple of questions were given to me outside of meetings. I want to say something about that. When I asked for questions to be written, what I meant was the questions that are brought up in meetings, if a person wants to be sure they are read here verbatim, then please write them down, but it's a, about a question that we're discussing in a meeting, group, or individual. It's a little bit hard for me to receive more questions outside of meetings. And I'll, I'll explain why. I'm spending a lot of hours a day in meetings and giving talk and cherish the time when I can drop it all for a while not have to think of any question or read any question, just watch the birds or go for a walk, enjoy a rest. So here, here are questions which were handed. 
are we here also? I feel more of a contact with the questioner if we discuss it in a group or one-on-one, -on -one, then we can explore where does the question come from. And there is some more mutuality than if I just read something and sort of had no contact with the person. But I'll read it anyways. Are we here to learn how to control our lives and be free from our psychological needs? Or are we here to learn how to let go and be fully human, complete with our shallow, as you call them, psychological needs? And here's another. What have we really achieved by dropping traditional forms that make us feel good and secure, like chanting, incense, when now we seem to be deriving the same satisfactions from other practices at the center, which seem to have become sacred, like cleanliness, conservation, frugality, punctuality, etc. Isn't this even more dangerous because we make it even more important than we ever made chanting, bowing, and burning incense, which we knew were just forms, while these new gods are accepted as being more real because they make sense. Can we drop even the ideal of sensibility too? Do we trust the moment enough? Or are we still holding on to stale ideals for security? This last question, I feel, would be good to bring to a group discussion. We have those on Sunday mornings, or to a group meeting here. Because what is the center? This always gives me an uncomfortable feeling, someone referring to this center is doing this or that. We're a bunch of people here, as one person expressed it, bungling along. It's amazing to me, as well as everyone else, how everything in the end functions so well. Because if you, if you would come to a staff meeting, you would find many different people with many different conditionings, opinions, feelings of what is important and what is not important. Cleanliness is not important to everyone. Some people, it is very important, to myself it is. Somebody else may not be important. Somebody else may be indifferent toward it. Have we installed this as God? We'd have to hear more from each other about this. A, a factual note, we are visited periodically by the health department. And if our kitchen, our bathrooms, shower, hot tub were not clean, we could be cited, fined, or closed down. So we have a certain responsibility being a public, whatever we are, public something or other. What do we call a perma, a, a hotel? Temporary huh? Temporary a temporary residence. We have to conform to certain standards in that. Always hold our breath a little bit when the man comes through. He may change, the present one is very friendly, another one may be picky. Now during retreat, there's more cleaning going on than any other time. I think I'm correct in this. It's a daily thing, more people. Maybe sometimes there's, there's no dirt to be clean, and yet one's job is cleaning. That's what I had to do at home. Every day we dust it, every day in our home, and we had maids for this, but at times when the maids were out, I had to do that. And I swore, when I had my own home, I would only dust when there was some dust. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, I've at times felt, I would like it cleaner than things are here at times. And I have learned with my very Germanic, uh, middle-class cleaning, cleanliness, 
Once a day cleaning and once a week the cleaning lady came to clean with the maid to do, I don't know what they did. <laughs> so for me it's been a tremendous learning process to live with some dust and cobwebs and some stuff in the corners. Or behind the kitchen sink, you know what accumulates behind the kitchen <laughs> on the drain board where the dishes drain. Sometimes don't even want to look at it. <laughs> As for punctuality, ask some of the people who would like the work crew to start at 8.30. It doesn't happen usually. I don't think this quite describes us, but let us be open to hearing more about it. We have once a Sunday in an on period, a discussion period, we have staff meetings in which we have learned to really listen to each other's complaints or statements. And then you will find what kind of different people we are. There's not one motto here, one um, one sense of what is important. We have many different senses of what is important. Some people even wonder whether giving a talk daily is important. Is important. Or just meeting with Tony is important. Maybe we should meet with each other. We're discussing it all the time. And not to judge too quickly without doing some research of what is really going on. And then also as such fertile ground to, to examine each one of us when we make such a statement. Where are we coming from? Out of what stuff is the question or uh, coming? Is there hurt or anger or, or feeling that one sees something that these others don't see? I have to point it out to them. Disappointment? We can all discuss it. Look at it. Have we made gods out of stuff? Whatever that means, we have to be very uh, direct in saying what we mean. And then look at it. Is it so? Isn't it so? Are we here to learn how to control our lives? Are we? Are we here to learn to control our lives? Be free from our psychological needs? Or are we here to learn how to let go and be fully human? Can we learn how to be fully human? Can we learn to let go? Wish it were so. Or can we just begin to observe what's there? without control, or observe the controlling, the need to control myself, to control others, control the situation. That's what I feel we're here for, to, to begin to see what's going on, not learn new habits. We may pick them up as we go. We're habit animals. What does it mean to be fully human? To see just how we are this moment? Everything open to inspection, to looking, listening, without judgment, not wanting to be otherwise, not setting up an ideal of I'm not fully human yet until I reach such and such a state, or I got to control myself more. It's, it's not looking. But to see control come up and the security of control, then there's a discovery made. In, in discovering something about ourselves, there can be a real joy. Even though what is discovered is something that may 
not to fit into our ideal of ourselves, but the discovery is the important thing, to see how we are, alone and with each other. Needs and all. Need for happiness. That's what we said yesterday we would come to today. And it generated about the most discussion with people, this thing about happiness. What is happiness? As, as we're asking it right now, what is happiness? We have to think, don't we? Think about something that made us happy in the past, that felt good, that we would like to have, as one person said, not just for fleeting moments, but as an enduring presence. And it involves thought, projection, memory. Doesn't it? Does it? I would like to be happy and I think of something. A better house, a better spouse, better conditions, more money, like one person said, more money, a better job, being somebody in this world being able to travel. Thinking about all of that can already make one semi-happy. Because thoughts generate energies and feelings throughout this organism. That is observable by each one of us. Oh, let me interject here the question that someone asked. How am I to observe this mind which moves so rapidly? What will slow it down so I can observe it? It's a very good question. And what, what slows it down is observing it. Observing it and not giving up. Maybe just catching the tail end, tail end of the train, the caboose. <clears throat> and looking again, following a thought all the way through. And maybe seeing, is there something between two trains of thoughts? Or are they totally linked, no gap? There are gaps between thoughts. That's noticeable if one looks intently, intensely. It sounds like effort, doesn't it? Well, somebody now gave the go-ahead. Let's have the effort. <laughs> in, in observing the mind, without giving up, without judging, or if judgment takes place, to observe that and the effects. The mind does slow down. It happens that way. Why, I don't know. Sometimes one person said, I looked at something uh, very intensely. What about it was, I don't remember. And it wasn't there anymore. It was just nothing for a moment. Try to look at a thought, and, and where is it? So, in, in, not to give up if one, if one is just starting this, this thing. The mind slows down on its own when there's interest to observe itself, understand itself, listen to its movements and reactions in a non-judgmental way, which includes listening to the judgments as part of this mind. So we were with happiness. Wondering what happiness is. And realizing that just right now here in this room, wondering what it is, when I was happy or how I would be happy, we have to think, don't we? Thinking is a vehicle for 
projecting happiness, anticipating it. I remember as a child, what I looked for, forward to most were my birthday party. Mine, not my sister's or brother, mine. Because mm -hmm. then I was the center of everything. We, we always had very lavish birthday parties. 20, some 20 or 24 children were invited and there was every, every cake I loved and I loved lots of cake. And, but in the lots of gifts, of course, everybody brought something for me. But more than that, my mother was not ever angry on a birthday party. She was beautiful, mellow, loving, enjoying herself. She did not get into trouble with my brother and he didn't get in trouble with her. It was a, a marvelous time, just as, like Christmas was the same thing. Whenever we had guests, my mother was just beautiful, loving, friendly, giving. My father took the movies. I had no, not much problem with him. He was, he was much more equanimous. So I looked forward to these birthday parties and the anticipation of it made me happy for weeks ahead, ahead of time. Even so much so that sometimes when the, when the day was there, I wondered whether it was quite as happy as my anticipation of it. And I learned very early that in reflecting, taking sort of time out from this moment to wonder, am I really happy, does something to the quote-unquote happiness. There comes the weighing, the measuring. Am I as happy as I thought I would be? Could I be more happy? And with that, the moment of being here joyfully, harmoniously slips away. I'm now engaged in, in measuring and comparing and wondering. We've, we've all noticed this, haven't we? So in addition to being carried through thought and image, the, the ideal of happiness sometime in the future. It also has to do very much with me, with my idea of what I would like for myself. Although the fact that my brother did not get into trouble on my birthdays was a big factor too. I suffered immensely with what went on with him and the family. But still, isn't, isn't, we're looking at it together, I'm not looking alone, am I? Isn't happiness basically for me? What I want for myself? I may want for myself happiness for all sentient beings, but it's, isn't it still somewhere my own satisfaction that I need? in knowing that all sentient beings are happy. We're looking at it, we're not condemning it. We're not analyzing it to bits, we're just looking. This one person who said, when I think of wanting to be happy, I want to strive for it, pursue it, I set, set myself up for disaster. What we, we discussed it during two meetings. So, what, what what came up was, I expect something to happen for me, and it may go completely against the flow of things around me. My family, like the general conditions, the people I am with, work with. Wanting my happiness, usually, it may be, there may be extraordinary cases where it takes into consideration everybody around me. But then the whole thing changes anyways. Usually, I don't take into consideration everything and everybody around me. 
And I'm not judging this, I'm just looking at it. And therefore, I set myself up in some kind of conflict or not the same rhythm or flow as everything around me. And from that comes come problems, frustrations. I'm not getting my way. Somebody is blocking my happiness. Somebody is not behaving the way I wanted to be happy. People at the job, the, the work situation. I was happy at my job and I got fired. So we, we do and we can strive for our, our own happiness, but it is forever elusive, even though maybe there for a moment or two. Because then the measuring mind takes over and wonders, is this enough? Is this all I want? Couldn't I have more of it? And with that, happiness has melted like snow and sunshine. Also, it happens that this organism gets used to things. That's an amazing phenomenon. We get used to things. We get used to each other, used to a beautiful scenery, used to good food, used to happiness. There's something in this brain and organism, it's equipped with some kind of a mechanism which makes it get used to things, not pay attention to things anymore. Take it for granted. and then seek new or more stimulation. Can one observe that in oneself? Maybe coming here to spring water for the first day when one is sometimes intoxicated by the freshness of the air, unless the smoke just comes down this way. There's an incredibly sweet, fresh fragrance of air here. Do we still smell it? we who live here, coming from the city with... Some cities have, have no spot of fresh air anymore. It just doesn't exist anymore. Put your nose wherever you want to. I spent a, a week or so in Warsaw. I can't begin to tell you how, it, how oppressive the, the air smelled. I wasn't a week right in the city. <coughs> Went a little bit outside and it was better. <coughs> but the people there don't smell it anymore. They're used to it. Nobody remarked about it. I, I just tried to inhale as little as possible. <laughs> <laughs> but coming here, do we get used to it too? The incredible gift. One, one person moved from abroad to this area just to be able to breathe this air here because it was so health-giving, vitalizing. One may go wherever, travel to, this, to the seashore, to the mountains, the valleys, and after a while, if, if the mind doesn't remain open and, and alive, it gets to be ho-hum. So what? One doesn't see the ocean coming in, or glistening of the sand, beauty of the mountains. And that's one reason why happiness is so elusive, because of the tendency of this body-mind to get used to things, and want more and new and fresh stimulation. In discussing it in several meetings with different people, there seemed to be no disagreement that if 
conditions in which one finds oneself, putting one's happiness or unhappiness aside, just looking at the conditions as clearly and objectively as one can. If they don't make sense, incoherent, detrimental to one's health or, or well-being, whatever, one can look at it, then why not change the conditions? Why not go someplace else? Change a spouse? People do it all the time. Successfully? Always remains to be seen because we get used to each other. But if our relationship with each other is nothing but <coughs> destructive quarreling and fault finding and hatred, why continue that? Although I'm just reading a book where two people managed in an amazing way to get through this totally destructive deadlock that they had gotten into. Both of them being interested to, to resolve this, to get to the bottom of it, to look at it, discuss it with each other in the presence of a third person. But it may not always work. So we're not saying You've got to be happy wherever you are. I haven't said that, have I? So coming back to the question, is there, you seem to make a difference between happiness and joy. I do. But I'm just using two words, A and B. I'm willing to use happiness for joy and joy for happiness. It's nothing intrinsically, intrinsic in these words. But right now, for the time being, happiness covering all of that which is spawned by thought and idea, imagination, past memory and anticipation in the future, and mainly re revolving around me in this cocoon that I call myself. I can expand the cocoon to take in others, but it's still my satisfaction that is paramount, dominant, my happiness. I can't stand to live with somebody who's unhappy, so that's why I want to make him happy, just so I can stand being with him. Or her. I'm not talking about my husband. <laughs> Whereas joy, and I'm sure everybody has come upon this, like someone sitting on the bench and they're probably not concerned about himself, herself, not the thoughts revolving, am I happy or not, and the cool breeze touching the face in the midst of this fog, overcast sky in which the colors become so vivid, the browns of the decaying leaves shine. And realizing there was a moment of joy. That word right now, for the time being, let's use it for what happens when I'm not so concerned, when I'm not seeking for happiness, when I'm not at odds with anything, when I'm not there, to, to stake things out for myself. <clears throat> my advantages, my disadvantages, my prerogatives, my needs, my opinions, my hurts, I'm not putting it down. I'm just saying when that is quiet, that whole circuit that whole network of concerns about myself with all of its emotions, sensations, feelings, when that is quiet, in abeyance, then there may be what we can call joy, the joy of being, not the idea of being. Because the moment we say, oh, I'm joyful, I'm being, then that's the circuit again. The, the lightness of, 
of somebody said that in a meeting like a leaf isn't it just like being a leaf blown or not blown off the tree and it's not just a leaf it's the song of the birds and the, 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 the peck, woodpecker the, the cough and the movements the breath the light and dark the whole thing the whole thing no one separate from it. The joy and lightness of that. By joy meaning a, an energy which is not in conflict, is not rubbing up against anything. Not against the flow or with the flow. It's just, it's everything, the whole thing. And in that, amazingly enough, in that there is joy and lovingness without having prepared for it or, or practiced it. It's there. And it, it fills, it fulfills. It doesn't fulfill me, but it fills everywhere. Whether it's touched or not depends on what circuit we are running on. Internally. And that determines our external environment too. Whether it looks doomy, dark, gloomy, or alive, even when it's overcast. Please, I'm not saying, I didn't say, get rid of the, the circuit and dwell in joy. I'm not elevating a sense or condition of no self to be the new dogma or God. No, we're not doing that. We usually live in that circuit of me and mine and my concerns and anxieties. Did I hurt his feelings or her feelings? And mine are certainly hurt by him or her. And then if we don't give very light attention to it, clear attention to it, there's retaliation going on underhandedly so that we don't notice it. Paying back or misunderstanding, misunderstanding, compounding. That's how we live a lot of the time. There's also, there are also happy birthday parties with wonderful cake. Being happy when other people are happy. Being happy to clean something and somebody says, oh, you did a beautiful job. Nobody's ever cleaned so well. Feeling good about it. It's all part of living. But how, how light are we dwelling in that, in that circuit? How lightly or are we so invested that there's fear of letting go? Fear of even looking at it? Or fear of having it questioned? for security, somebody mentioned in the question. What is security? What is security? Is there such a thing as security? 
security and incense in gods, in people, in happiness, in ideas, or in the idea of no ideas. And it's always foiled somehow, somehow or other. Something happens and it's upset. It vanishes. And we seek anew. What is security? What, is, what does it mean to be secure? We, not, we won't throw it out right away and say there is no such thing. We could say, Imagined security is just what it is, and it's setting oneself up for disaster. Strive for it. But is there such a thing as being secure? The me being secure? Can the me be secure? Being cut off from the whole? It can figure out and establish itself fields of security, but it's still insecure because it is apart is not the whole. It is afraid and wants. Let's, let's leave that question, sit there, whether there is, is such a thing as security, complete security. We will end here for today.